being recorded. We'd like to remind everyone to please make sure that you're on mute unless you're one of our speakers talking or unless you're asked to unmute to ask a question. Um, questions can be also submitted using the chat feature. We have several of our LLN board members helping us monitor the chat. And there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the very end um, of the Q&A session. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it to Noemi, who will let us all know the importance of registering our attendance today. Noemi? Thank you so much, Monica. This is Noemi Solorzano Thompson. I serve as the secretary for the Latino Leadership Network. I've put in the chat the attendance link, and I'll put it throughout the webinar for those of you who come in late or those of you who forget. There's also for those of you who are more tech savvy than me, a QR code that you can log in. And the QR code is uh, takes you to the attendance link. So just so you know, in order to provide these wonderful programmings, we have to do uh, reports to the Office of Financial Management, which is the one that oversees business resource groups. And because of the way that Zoom works, it's we're unable to actually know who's here. Zoom limits what we can see in the reports. So hence, we ask that you fill out this uh, web attendance form. Uh, where we ask your name and email, and then there's other questions about how involved do you want to be with LNN. And of course, we also have our email where you can email us. It's very important because literally this is what allows us to bring programs like this one. So we ask that you please fill it out. Again, I will be sharing the community, I mean, the, the attendance link uh, throughout the day uh, so that in case you forget. Um, and somebody saying about websites, we don't have a current website for LNN, uh, but the way that to do it, uh, Vanessa, if you could please put our um, email in the chat, email us at LNN at OFMWAT.gov. I answer those emails with Vanessa and we'll get you in touch uh, and involved with LNN. So back to Monica, thank you. Thank you so much, Noemi. Appreciate it. Um, a few community agreements to go through. First, stay engaged. Speak your truth. No fixing. Experience discomfort. Take risks. Listen for understanding. And expect and accept non-closure. Um, next slide is a little bit about LLN and what we do. Uh, if this is your first time attending, welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, LLN is a business resource group supported by the Office of Financial Management um, to provide Latinos and their allies in state government a place to have a sense of community. Uh, it is our goal and vis <laughs> vision and mission to connect uh, with our Latino workforce and to help connect and invest and inspire and serve our members. Uh, and then we also do like to note that while we do use the term Latino, we do hope that it for now is inclusive enough and it does um, apply to anybody that identifies as, as Hispanic, Latino or Latina, Latinx, Latine, um, and all and all of those allies that like to support us in this space. Now I'd like to introduce Regina Melvo, who is the executive director of the Washington State Women's Commission. And Regina, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, your team member that you have with you today, and then provide us an introduction about the Women's Commission and, and what it is that you do. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having us. I am on vacation today, but I was delighted to have the opportunity uh, to join you this month. So thank you for extending that, in, uh, that invitation. Um, again, my name is Regina Melvo. I am the executive director of the Washington State Women's Commission. As a commission, we were uh, established by the governor's office, uh, I'm sorry, established by the legislature um, and codified in um, the Washington Administrative Code uh, in 2018. And we were created with the goal of uh, advising the governor and the legislature on issues that disproportionately impact women. Uh, I was one of the original nine appointed commissioners. And then when my uh, predecessor, Michelle Gonzalez, moved on to another position in government, uh, I moved into the staff role of executive director. And um, really, is this has been a wonderful full circle um, 
full circle kind of career moment for me. So I feel so grateful, um, so grateful. And one way to think about the work of the Women's Commission is um, sort of like we're uh, internal lobbyists for women and girls in Washington. And you'll see as we get further into the presentation, the, the specific issues that we, we tend to focus on. Um, but um, before, before we, if we can go back a slide. Um, but formally, our vision is that every woman and girl is healthy, safe, prosperous, and empowered to achieve their full potential. At our recent uh, strategic planning retreat, um, we made a commitment to revisit already our mission, vision, and values in January. We want to make sure that we capture and thrive in our vision because we know that um, every woman uh, and girl has uh, the right um, to do exactly that. Uh, and our mission really is one where uh, the Washington State Women's Commission is able to improve the life of every woman and girl by ensuring equitable opportunities, removing systemic barriers through engagement, advocacy, and public policy, while of course always being inclusive of our diverse populations. So we can move forward to slide now. So um, I'm our, our paid staff leadership, but really the, um, the uh, heavyweights of the commission are the commissioners themselves. We have nine of them. Uh, I would encourage all of you to visit our website, read each of their bios. I think you'll be really, really proud of the women who represent you at uh, the Women's Commission. Uh, Graciela Calgar Cal Gomez rolled off after her term uh, ended last year, but she was one of our original uh, nine appointed commissioners, was our first commission chair, is still a great ally of the commission. And uh, she had hoped to join me today, but it turns out uh, she's not going to be able to. But um, it's the goal of the commission to represent um, um, many, uh, many and most um, ethnic identities, as well as um, geographies across the state. That's difficult to do with only nine positions, but we also have committees uh, that we are always actively recruiting for. And then I'll also talk at the end of the presentation about how to apply to um, be considered not only for the Women's Commission, but any commission, including the Commission on Hispanic Affairs. And I think there are about 230 um, boards uh, that are uh, potential gubernatorial appointment positions. So we'll get to that at the close of the presentation. Our legislative advisors are listed here, but um, I would very much say that um, our leadership includes um, my two amazing team members, um, Kate Sowers, who's our program ma manager, who's not on the call, and uh, Leah White, who is on the call with that beautiful um, capital background with the cherry blossoms in full bloom. While I love the changing um, leaves and the foliage uh, that's taking place right now, I will admit that I, I miss the cherry blossoms. But so the Women's Commission really is made up of all the folks that I just talked about. Um, next slide, please. And yes, yeah, so our agency priorities really fall under um, three primary buckets. Those are health, safety, and economic opportunity and security. So safety tends to capture those issues that people often uh, think of traditionally as women's issues, domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, trafficking, uh, and we've added gun violence to this area. We know of course that none of those issues are gender specific, but they do disproportionately impact women. Um, when we move on and talk about health, um, obviously, uh, actually our health committee was formed um, after the COVID pandemic began. So COVID response is at the top, but primarily that committee is really charged with looking at health disparities uh, among women, particularly women of color. And uh, that tends to really be impacted in areas like maternal and child health disparities, mental health access, et cetera. Um, of course, um, abortion access also falls under health, um, arguably also under safety. And while we know that here in Washington state, um, those protections um, continue despite the changes at the, by the US Supreme Court, um, that's a, a significant area of policy uh, right now uh, coming out of the governor's office. Uh, moving on to economic opportunity and economic security. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, not moving on to the slide, just me moving on to a new subject area. Um, really, the primary impetus for the creation of the Women's Commission 
uh, had to do with the really significant disparity in economic opportunity and pay between men and women in Washington state. And we will shortly get to um, how much even deeper that disparity is for um, Latinas. And so this is an area of opportunity uh, for LLN and the Women's Commission, um, I really believe to work closely on. We know that Latina Pay Day is coming up December 8th. So I'd like us to think really hard and get creative about what kind of a campaign we can do, um, you know, both a social media campaign and any other events we might want to uh, collaborate on to really um, highlight that area. But um, in terms of our ongoing work, our Economic Opportunity and Security Committee really focuses on uh, not only pay equity, but um, creating living wage um, career pathways, looking at digital equity. We know so many families were impacted, uh, particularly early on in the pandemic when they didn't have access to um, broadband and the internet. And so uh, that really brought um, a, an important and necessary issue to bear. And um, so we feel grateful to have been a voice in that conversation and um, have seen a lot of a lot of investment happen in underinvested communities and those communities, particularly rural communities, that did not have full access to digital equity. Um, alternative workplace options. Again, we know there are many, many folks who were whose whose specific roles did not allow them to work from home during the pandemic. But we also know that there were many people who were able to successfully transition. Um, out of the traditional workplace into work from home. And it made their work, and not only did they remain very productive employees, but it made their work-life balance much easier. And so we have um, uh, really been a voice for uh, state agencies to uh, allow those folks who have, been who have been working successfully in that way to continue to do so as long as it doesn't negatively impact the business case. Um, we know that unfortunately the, the unpaid labor of um, uh, caring for, for kiddos and taking care of home all too often falls on women. And so to the extent that we can help um, employers be creative about how they support uh, their women employees, recognizing um, the multiple roles that we play, uh, that, that feels very important. Obviously also under economic um, security uh, issues related to poverty, childcare access to affordability and affordable housing. So we tend to think of those as the safety net issues. And then finally, our legislative advocacy and um, outreach focus on the priorities that come out of those committees. And um, obviously that committee gets most active during session, which uh, tends to be January through late March. I believe it'll go into uh, April this year, but that's another important area of opportunity for um, collaboration between the Women's Commission and LLN. Uh, as your organization identifies key legislative priorities, we want to be a voice for supporting you there. So next slide, please. And as I said, really our approach to how we tackle any of these issues is through legislative advocacy, which happens, you know, again, during session, but also with having um, a continuous conversation with legislators all year long. We do a lot of information gathering and research and putting that out through our social media and um, usually uh, two or three reports a year. We work hard at work. We, you know, we know that government cannot solve and does not have the money to solve, honestly all of the big major um, problems that, that, that face women and families. And so we're really big on how do we find and work with our public and private partners um, to get the needs of women met. We have a lot of close relationships with nonprofit organizations that are serving women and families, particularly those living in poverty, um, community outreach and resource referral. So um, I, I'd like to say that I'm really proud of um, my team, which has done an exceptional job of building a strong um, resource and referral page embedded in our website. So for those of you who um, have not yet had time, I put our um, web address in the chat, so it's there. And you know, at your leisure, just kind of come through it, but um, the last tab actually is the resource and referral page. And there's, it's just a plethora of um, uh, information and access that you 
um, can find information about most any topic, uh, find help and a link to access an organization working on almost any topic that you can imagine. So thank you, next slide. And things that we've done, this is obviously only a tiny fraction of what we've accomplished, but some of the things that we're really, really proud of um, under my, as I said, our former director's leadership, Michelle Gon Gonzalez, um, she crafted a model policy for sexual harassment to share with um, agencies to use not only state agencies uh, across the board, but created uh, a modified version for small businesses. Uh, we were instrumental in helping pass the Women on Corporate Boards Act. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, but um, most publicly traded companies do not have the level of representation of women on their boards that um, they should have. And so we were um, really instrumental in making sure that that uh, passed. I will tell you, I believe one of the most significant accomplishments that I certainly will leave with when whenever I leave the commission is um, our support for the Fair Start for Kids Act, which is really the legislation where um, the state of Washington invested, I believe it was 1.5 billion with a B dollars in creating additional um, dollars for affordable childcare. So currently you have to really, really um, be at or under the poverty line or be on TANF um, in order to access subsidy dollars and, and those, Numbers have increased so that many, many, many more families, even middle income families, will qualify for some level of child care subsidy because we know that child care is a, uh, an expense that just is crippling for so many families. Um, the Fair Start for Kids Act also invested in increasing um, subsidy reimbursement rates, better paying child care providers who we know are among the lowest paid workforce. We know that uh, that workforce actually um, uh, includes many, many, many uh, Latina entrepreneurs. Uh, the Fair Start for Kids Act also included um, money for professional development and small business support for those, um, those entrepreneurs operating um, family and small child care centers. So again, something else we're really proud of. This last year, it's not listed on the slide, but there was a major streamlining of um, a variety of kinds of protection orders. Um, and uh, I, I think I may have mentioned that I come from a background of running large social service agencies that um, provide services for victims of um, sexual and domestic violence. And uh, we were part of the voice and we conducted a listening tour of um, advocates and survivors from for, throughout the state around the issue of coercive control, um, which is a, a, a um, form of abuse that has become much, much, much more prevalent as technology has evolved. And yet it, is, it was not included in the statute. So it is now included in the definition of domestic violence, which was an extraordinary win. Um, for victims. And, and I think, again, another one of the things that I'm very, very proud of uh, as, as leader of the commission. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, and really our goals, as I said, we just really want to make sure that the voice of women and girls of Washington state is heard by the governor and legislators as they are formulating policy that in, in impacts us. Um, in order to do that, we really uh, work hard and listen to hear and better respond to the most vulnerable and historically excluded voices with the goal of helping guide, helping guide the governor's agenda. Uh, I really hope that we are defining and exemplifying inclusivity in our work and that we um, are working to increase the capacity of the commission because all of the issues that you just heard me talk about that's obviously a lot, a uh, lot of very important issues requiring a lot of time and effort. And we currently are a team of three. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to just touch on the Latina pay inequity stats and Leah is gonna leave this presentation um, with Noemi. So we're happy to, you know, for you to be able to share it with um, uh, all of the attendees. Excited to see that we have almost 70 people who've joined us, but 
Um, it's abysmal, the, the level of pay inequity for women across the board, but it is horrific that um, our uh, Latina sisters really um, are the most impacted. And as you can see from the statistic, that at, at the current rate, it would be 2197 um, before pay equity would be reached. So, I mean, that's, that's just obscene. And um, what we know is that currently Latinas are compensated at just 57% of what non-Hispanic white men are paid, which means that they have to, would need to work almost an entire extra year of full-time year round work in order to be paid the same wage. There's no reason for that. That's a, that, that is a false dichotomy. And so we, um, we need to do whatever we can, wherever we can to uh, eliminate um, or at least close this gap um, um, where there are policies that we can impact. And as I said, I'm very excited about how Monica and I can uh, you know, brainstorm about ways that we can work together to really highlight this issue on December 8th, but more importantly, not just, you know, how do we make sure everybody knows about it, but what do we then do together to try to help effectuate it so that we can close, close that gap. Next slide, please. And, you know, I wanna point out sometimes when, when you give statistics like this, people think you're being hyperbolic. And I just want people to take note of the fact that the, um, the reference comes from census.gov. So this is the United States government's statistic. Um, it's not made up, it's real, and it's um, embarrassing and horrific. And one of the things that's so frustrating is it, it extends across class, class lines. So not only um, for low wage occupations, but all the way up to um, executive positions. And I, don't, I won't enumerate those, because again, we're gonna share the, um, we're gonna share the slideshow so that you will have access to it. But one of the most compelling, I think data points coming out of um, our research to me was this next point, uh, which is that um, more than 3 million families in the United States um, are headed by Latinas and um, a full third of them live below the poverty line. So that's literally more than 1 million Latina headed households living in poverty. That's, I mean, it's just, it's unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. And, um, you know, to the extent that there are things that we can do to change that, um, we want and need to be a voice for those changes. Um, I think, uh, next slide, please. As I said, Latina Equal Pay Day is December 8th. So we will um, follow up um, uh, with Monica Noemi and the team to look at ways that we can um, not only uh, promote on social media a campaign to talk about this, but more importantly, what substantive changes should we be considering supporting in the legislative session? Next slide. Um, and then really, I just wanted to give you a quick sense of what we've done to date relative to partnership around um, these kinds of issues. So uh, Latina health disparities, um, we, we did two major events last year. The first one was a uh, webinar focusing on the pandemic's toll on Latina women. It, it was a conversation with three amazing, amazing Latina leaders. Would encourage you once you have access to the PowerPoint to click on that link. It's also on our website um, and, and listen to that conversation. It was really, um, really stimulating um, and empowering despite um, you know, some of the really difficult content that was discussed. And then also in Washington state, there was a study conducted by the Latino Center for, for Health out of the University of Washington School of Social Work that gives a lot of important um, data that you might find of interest. So I would encourage you to visit their website. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is that webinar I was just talking about. And uh, again, as you can see, three of kind of the most prolific Latina leaders across our state came together to have this conversation with us and would really encourage you to um, visit the YouTube link to, um, to watch it on your own. Lee, can I ask you to pull that, that YouTube link out and pop it into the chat? That'll make it easier for folks so they wouldn't have to go dig for it. 
And then while Leah's doing that, just the final thing that um, I was going to touch on, folks often say, well, how can I get involved in your work? And um, as I mentioned, we have nine uh, commissioners. They um, each have uh, two, two year ter terms. Uh, and so that's not an awful lot of turnover that we have on the commission. However, we um, have opportunities to participate on our committees. We often do events where we are looking for volunteers and um, assistance. Um, let me back up because I just realized I, I skipped over a slide. Um, thank you, Leah. Uh, this, this is just a slide that shows uh, we did a stakeholder visit in um, Quincy and um, Yakima in uh, June, where we, the day in advance of our quarterly plenary meeting, we met um, at Quincy Community Health Center with about a dozen individual women leaders uh, who were from different grassroots organizations in the region. And we learned so, so, so much about the issues taking place um, in the Latinx community and particularly um, the migrant farm worker uh, community. And it's only through conversations like that that we can accurately represent to the governor, to the legislature, the things that we've learned and the issues that um, you know, folks are, are living with day to day. So uh, as I said, um, those were those our partnerships, um, partners, I'm so excited about having um, been able to join you today and um, about the work that I know that we will do together moving forward. Uh, okay, next slide. And I know we're actually all, I think I have run way over time, um, but as I said, um, um, there are so many opportunities to join, not just the Women's Commission, but um, uh, the Hispanic Commission or many of the other um, issues-based commissions uh, and boards. And I would encourage everyone, and if someone could pull that link out and drop it into the chat as well, uh, you can apply to any state board or commission through Governor Inslee's website. Uh, we, we accept applications all year round, although the Women's Commission tends to um, really review them most closely uh, in the mid spring, shortly before, uh, usually about two months leading up to the end of um, existing commissioners terms. And I guess that's the other good news for us at the commission, commissioners um, uh, are entitled to a maximum of two terms, but once they come up and they really, really enjoy their work, their time with us. And so uh, we have found we've not had a lot of turnover on the women's commission, but that will be, um, that will be um, changing. Um, what else did I want to say? Again, we're always looking for members that reflect the diverse lifestyles of our state, that, that, uh, that represent the diverse demographies, uh, demographics of our state, uh, and the diverse geographies, right? So we, we um, make sure that we have folks that, you know, aren't just from Seattle and Olympia, but from throughout the state. And the commission pays the, uh, pays and or reimburses the travel expenses for those that are participating as commissioners. Also, there's been recently passed legislation um, to provide stipends for folks who um, might not otherwise be able to participate in a board or commission um, because their companies don't necessarily support that kind of volunteerism. So um, while there previously honestly have been um, probably only a certain type of person uh, who was able to join a border commission. And that was typically a professional whose job would release them, um, you know, and allow them to attend things like this. Um, our state is really working hard to make sure that our um, government voice is inclusive um, of everyone. So um, I think that that's all I have from a presentation standpoint. And Monica, um, I think we're turning it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Regina. Um, I'm sure we yeah. have lots of questions in the chat, but I'm going to ask um, one that I think is probably, oh, thank you, Noemi. Uh, we did, we 
we've parceled out some of the questions so that we could get through some of this content together. Um, so first, let's go back to Latina Equal Pay on December 8th. Um, something that always gets in my head is what is, why are we focused on Latina Equal Pay Day on December 8th? What is, it's not, it's not a celebratory day. Um, <laughs> It's not it's not a day for a uh, celebration, but it is definitely a call to action. Um, so what can we do? What can people in this space do um, on December 8th or before December 8th or in preparation of December 8th? What can we do to be part of the Latina Equal Pay Movement? Um, I'm going to say I, I, I feel like because you and I have not yet brainstormed what really substantive thing we can do together, that the only call to action I have at the moment is to ask people to reshare the social media um, posts that we will do. And we will do them leading up to December 8th. So usually what we try to do anytime there's a very significant day like this is to say, hey, you know, December 8th is Latina Equal Pay uh, day and then provide data around the disparities and provide links to organizations who are working on these issues that people can get involved in. So I think the primary way for folks to assist will be for them to uh, follow the Washington State Women's Commission, watch for that content, reshare it on their own pages. And then um, if they're interested in diving in deeper, um, click on the organizations and sign up to receive their newsletters and calls to action for those organizations that are working on the issues. Great, wonderful. Um, for those of you in attendance today or watching this later on on YouTube, I do follow the uh, Washington State Women's Commission on Facebook and Instagram. I highly recommend that they do pass along really wonderful information in timely ways. Um, so I highly recommend following them on both. Um, for our second question, um, health equity, um, you touched on how that some how that sometimes <laughs> how that impacts uh, Latinas in and and our healthcare. Um, how what are some ways or why why is this important to us? What can we do to better support health equity and why is that important for Latinas in this space? Oh my gosh, that's a great, great, great big question that I honestly had intended to pass off to my commissioner who was not able to join us. Um, and that's totally and okay. We can always reconnect. We can provide these answers later on through our LinkedIn account or through our newsletter. Um, so not to catch- I love that. And, and I love it. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'd love the opportunity to have um, the co-chairs of our health committee um, perhaps do um, a webinar or a lunch and learn on that topic in, in particular. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then my last question uh, from our question slides was, are there any particular requirements to become a commissioner um, for the Women's Commission specifically, but are there requirements that we should be con considering if we want to apply to be a commissioner on the board? I think this is the wonderful thing about a, an organization like the Women's Commission. Our whole goal is to be inclusive and to include all of the historically underrepresented voices. So, um, so no, other than being a woman or someone who identifies as a woman, um, there is no specific criteria. And while, of course, we always are looking for balance, as I said, across um, this balance in terms of where folks are coming from across the state, balance in terms of age and occupation and sectors represented by those on the commission. Um, there is no hard and fast criteria. Um, and uh, as I said, beyond, and, and I would encourage folks to, even if they feel like they are not quite, you know, commission material. And I, I want to, first of all, challenge people to challenge that voice in their head. Um, I think I was just arrogant enough when I was young to believe that my voice was important. And I joined a lot of boards and, and it was very helpful to me. Um, not only was it helpful to me in my career, I believe it was very helpful and useful to the organizations that I volunteered for to have my perspective. 
uh, in their development of their programs and policies. And the same remains true for the Women's Commission. But so I would encourage folks, even if they're not sure that they qualify or are really ready to apply anyway, because that's the same database, if you will, from which we can then reach out to folks and say, hey, well, you know, we don't have any commission seats coming open. We do have this committee and we really need folks with your expertise on it. Or, oh, we do have this um, uh, event coming up and based on something that you submitted in your application, it seems like something that might be of interest. Would you like to help, you know, chair or co-chair this event? And so um, if, if, if the Women's Commission feels like someplace you'd like to be, go to the governor's page, click on the link, apply to be a commissioner. And um, you know, even if there are not commission seats readily available, there are many, many up, uh, other opportunities. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and my advice to anybody interested in applying is the advice I give to everybody, which is don't say no for them. At least put, make your voice be heard, put yourself out there. And like Regina mentioned, there might be other opportunities for your knowledge or support um, to be needed elsewhere. Um, at this point, we can open it up to anybody that might have questions. Um, hopefully I bought Vanessa and Noemi enough time to go through the chat to see if we have any questions in the chat. Um, other than that, if you'd like to raise your hand or, or ask a question out loud, please feel free to do so. We'd like this interactive Q&A part um, to be as interactive as possible. I'll turn it first to Noemi or Vanessa. Do we have questions in the chat? I just wanted to say that a lot of the questions have been about sharing materials. Just so you know, those of you who are on the LNN government delivery, and if you're not, email us at lnnofm1.gov, uh, and we will gladly uh, add you. We're going to be sharing the PowerPoint that the Women's Commission uh, prepared for us. Uh, first, I have to run it through an accessibility check because uh, through that, we need to do that. So it won't, the PowerPoint won't be immediately mailed, but it will be emailed. And when we email it, we'll also give you the link to the recording in uh, YouTube so that you can review the conversation and feel free to share that link with whomever the YouTube uh, page is public. So all the questions have been around, uh, you know, wanting to get more information so that will be shared. So we have time now for other questions from the audience. Again, you can put them in the chat and either Vanessa or I will read them from the chat. You can also raise your hand and speak out loud, whatever you prefer. And if you're going to be raising your hand, please do the Zoom hand because we cannot see everybody on the screen. Uh, and I also remind you to please Please do the attendance link. I'm going to share it again. Uh, it's very important. Only uh, about half, well, after I'd said about half, a little bit more than half of the people have signed in. But if you don't have, if you don't sign in, we don't have an official record that you were here. Thank you. So questions. Oh, here's a question. Uh, first question from Desiree Monroy. Do you have any concerns or would you support a commission on men? I've seen some work around disparities that men are facing in Washington, particularly around incarceration. Great question. Yeah, I was, um, I've been approached with this question a couple of times and I will be honest and tell you my initial reaction was that men in general don't experience the level of disparities that women do. And I, I, I kind of not scoffed at the idea, but honestly was a little bit offended by it. Um, once I saw a little bit more of the data, there certainly there it is. It is absolutely true that there are some issues that disproportionately impact men, but they're very um, they're very complex. And one of the things that bothered me the most about the initial proposal that I saw relative to a men's commission was that it didn't do a deep enough dive, in my opinion, relative to men of color. Um, who absolutely experience all of those issues at really significantly um, um, disproportionate rates. So um, while I wouldn't oppose it per se, I don't know that I'd sign in um, in support of it in my official capacity, um, but I'm someone who's always open to obtaining more data, more information, and if the data is convincing, then absolutely.
but again, the, the, the whole reason for the creation of the Women's Commission is because women are so disproportionately impacted. Again, if we just go to the Latina pay area, white men, a, a Latina woman would have to work an additional year in order to make the same amount of money that a white man makes in one year. So in my mind, that framing tells us why we need a women's commission versus a men's. Next question from the chat is, does the Washington State Women's Commission balance as far as race? So I guess this is a question about the current demographics of the commissioners. Uh, absolutely. I think if you if you go, to, uh, actually, all of our commissioners' uh, photos are there. So I think we're about the most ethnically diverse group that I have seen um, of any board or commission that, that I've ever been a part of. Having said that, there's only nine commission seats. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always important um, for the governor to be paying attention to that as he's looking at appointments while he's also considering making sure that you know, all the geographies are represented, et cetera. Thank you for answering all of those questions, Regina, and thank you for the work that you're doing at the Women's Commission. Um, at one point in time, I think I've fallen into most of those challenges, demographics categories that you shared. Uh, sometimes Same. for us to have a job, to be able to provide insurance and health care to our children is part of the battle, but then being provided the time to take our children for these health care checkups um, comes out of the same bucket that it does for ourselves. And so Absolutely. I myself neglected a lot of my own health care because by the time I used my time off for all of my children, there was none left for me. Later on, this caused a huge bill for me um, when it came to catching up with all of my dental health and other health issues that I neglected for too long. So if we think that these things don't affect us to an, to any certain degree, they really do. Um, having to use all of my time off to meet my children's needs was not the choice of my employer. It was my choice, right? It was based on limitations that my family had at the time. However, I wouldn't have had to put my career on hold for so long if there were people helping me find affordable quality childcare, if there were ways for me to work while not working myself through continuing poverty by having to pay for um, really expensive childcare. And, and so I think it's so amazing. I go through that entire personal rant to share that at any point in time, I, I would fell into the demographic that you're trying to serve and you're trying to find solutions for. Um, so for past me, I say thank you. For future me, I say thank you. And for um, the future females in Washington, thank you for the work that you're doing at the Women's Commission. Um, we still have plenty of time for questions. So if there is, uh, I just, I just saw a great question and, um, I'm, I'm, I, I hope I am not getting your name wrong, but, um, is it Root Perez? You said, how is the women's commission working with women in the maritime industry? We are not, and I would love to be. So if you have recommendations about, um, how we can or should, be helping strengthen that pipeline of women in the maritime industry. We absolutely know that there's an enormous shortage of um, talent with the ferries. And that's a pretty um, skilled and well-paid job. And, um, and I know that um, that department has had a hard time uh, recruiting folks to um, train for the position. Um, one of the things I was excited about when um, uh, Toshigo Hashigawa, who is the executive director of the um, Commission on uh, Asian Pacific Affairs, but she's also an elected port commissioner. And part of her campaign platform when she ran before she won um, was how these jobs need to be more inclusive of women and women of color, they, uh, w women and people of color, they have historically not been, um, recruitment has histor historically not been toward either of those groups. And so I would love for the commission 
to get further involved in that work. So if you have any recommendations, please email me. Um, my email address is on, is on our website. And Leah, you can also put my email address in the chat there. I, Rude, I think you're on, I think you're on, I think you're on mute. Or I, I can see you, but I can't hear you at all. I can see you talking, but I don't hear you. Oh, that's unfortunate. I, sh I showed they're unmute unmuted. Yeah, I show her unmuted as well. Well, I think, I think that means we're supposed to have a, I think that means we're supposed to have a telephone conversation. So while I'm, I'm on vacation and out of town this week, uh, if you will send me an email, I will call you next week and I'd love to talk at length. Awesome. Regina, I'm so happy that we've already provided a wonderful bridge connection, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which just shows the power that we share when we get together and we talk about these issues out loud and we brainstorm with one another. So I'm so glad that if anything, we got a wonderful bridged connection out of this interaction. Absolutely. We still have plenty of time for questions. If people have more that they would like to put into the chat, again, if you want to raise your hand, we're happy to unmute you so you can ask your question and engage in dialogue with uh, Regina and Leah, why we while we have them here. So the next question from Michelle Avitia: Are there any minority Latina women mentorship opportunities for interagency government employed women? Monica, I think that's. That that's a <laughs> that's a pretty big question. Um, something that we get kind of uh, kind of frequently for Latino Leadership Network. Um, not at this time that we're willing to promote as a as a fruitful effort. Um, while the LLN constantly reevaluates our ability to provide mentorship opportunities to our group, we have yet to find a program or a process. Um, that fits with the model for BRGs right now. And the model for BRGs is that while we're encouraged to participate with our business resource groups, um, we still are dealing with a finite amount of support and hours to produce this work. Um, it really falls on the board, which is why we try to encourage so much participation from you, our members. Um, many hands make lighter work. So if you're interested in helping us tackle this mentorship issue, we would really value the attention, the time, anything that you can volunteer to help us make that effort more successful. It is something that Tony and I are, are, uh, are focusing on for this year, something we would like to at least start building some foundational support for a little bit with a more commitment than before, um, but it is a huge thing to tackle. So Regia, Regina or Leah, if you have any recommendations for mentorship programs outside of Latino Leadership Network, we'd love to hear any references towards those. Well, I was going to say mine is not relative to a program per se, but what I would say is that uh, we can and will do a better job of um, sharing resources, usually via um, Facebook or Instagram, giving women tips on how to um, become how to how to find and access mentors. So for example, I'm on vacation in North Carolina. I came here in June and was a speaker at an Aspen Institute like event. There's a young woman who works on this campus who just latched onto me. And she decided that I had information and knowledge that she could benefit from. She reached out to me and said, may I stay in contact with you? She absolutely did do that. Um, during her job search process, I helped her brainstorm a number of things. Um, we've talked a number of times about a number of issues, and I met her one time for two minutes at a conference, um, but she was a wonderful, strong self-advocate, and she saw where areas of my bio aligned with areas of her experience, and more importantly, areas that she hoped to add to her bio, right? So sometimes mentorship is less about a formal program and more about you identifying what it is that you need from a mentor 
and locating that person and quite frankly, impressing them in a way that prompts them to want to invest their time in you. So there's more than one way to get things done, I guess is my way of my way. That's of. essentially how it happened for me. <laughs> sometimes our mentors find us and sometimes we have to go um, help them realize that they want to mentor us. <laughs> and, and, and if I may add, Leah and I, Leah, who is the program coordinator at the commission, Leah and I met at a swimming pool when uh, I, I was taking my grandchildren swimming and her sons were swimming. And I think I had a bag or something with the commission logo on it. She inquired about the commission, shared her passion in our work, um, came to work first for us as an unpaid intern uh, for a few months and then left and went to go work in a paid position in the Senate. And as it happened, the um, legislature ended up funding us for an additional position. And so um, she was very competitive for that position when um, it, it opened up. So sometimes, again, it's just a matter of identifying um, people of like interest and passion. And um, hopefully, they're, hopefully they are willing to help you find your way. It's all about expanding that networking circle as well. So I, hopefully people find that tangible advice here in this space and that they're able to get more of that and the more events that they come to. Um, I did yeah. see a question pop up into the chat that I'd love our um, membership and outreach lead to address. Vanessa, would you like to tell us a little bit more about um, how people can get more involved with Latino Leadership Network? Yes, definitely. And thank you, Alma Valencia, for that question. How do we volunteer? So if this is your first time coming, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you could email LLN at OFM.wa.gov, I would be the one connecting with you, um, kind of doing like a one-on-one. -on -one. We're doing now in November group orientation, so or a little bit of informational sessions, talking to you a little bit about LLN, kind of gauging your interest. We do have about five committees and we are recruiting members for them, helping us do events, both just like the one you're attending today. We're also going to be doing some in person events come 2023, um, doing health and wellness, in person hikes, walks, yoga, meditation. So if this sounds like something interesting to you, please email us and I'll be connecting with you hopefully this week. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, not to speak out of turn or put any pressure on Vanessa, but I know she has some wonderful orientations and informational sessions planned for November. So if you're really interested in becoming more active with Latino Leadership Network, please feel free to reach out to us at the OFM um, email address and Vanessa will connect with you. We are about five minutes away from adjourning. So I want to make sure that I give ample opportunities for people to ask questions either in the chat or by raising their hand. I will also remind you again, if you have not yet filled out the Lunch and Learn attendance form, um, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, even if you filled one out at the previous events, we would still love to know if we're hitting the mark with our attendance goals, if we're able to provide the content that you're finding um, helpful, uh, informational, something that to inspire you or something to help, um, help bolster that professional development experience that we're all hoping to gain in this space. Um, we look forward to feedback as well. So if you'd like to provide some feedback on ways that you think we can improve the Latino Leadership Network and the quality of the content that we're providing, please feel free to give us that note as well by emailing the LLN at ofm.wa.gov email. Um, again, a huge thanks to Regina and Leah for coming today. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge about um, what you do at the Women's State Commission. And we really appreciate you taking the time to connect with us all here today. And again, I wanna highly encourage that if you have not yet Googled it or looked it up, web searched it, um, please follow them on Instagram and Facebook. They do put out a lot of really great informational content um, that can help keep us all in the same space and informed. So thank you so much for your time. Thank Regina, you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Have a wonderful week, everyone.
I am stopping the recording.